Welcome back to The Day That Was. I'm Lee McCabe. Now, staying on the South African morning, ENC anchor Gareth Edwards spoke to Sassel CEO Fleetwood Krobler. Sassel is currently driving the move towards green hydrogen as an alternative fuel. The Energy and Chemical Group aims to supply the transport sector with green hydrogen by next year and decarbonize the mining sector. Uh, it's, it's a good place as far as a POC is concerned. Uh, from a business perspective, I'm curious, uh, Fleetwood, so uh, this makes complete sense to me for Toyota because they're going to be selling hydrogen vehicles, air products, obviously that makes sense uh, why they would be involved. Uh, you are a, a fuel uh, organization. It's, it's entirely your business. Why would you want to move away from your moneymaker on this? So this is a part and parcel and central to our strategy. We are on a path of decarbonization and our objective is to um, transform our operations to reduce our carbon footprint. But in the long term, because we have the technology that we call Fisher Trops in South Africa that we've been practicing over the last 70 years, that process is basically agnostic to the source of carbon and hydrogen. So whilst we currently get it from uh, fossil fuels like coal and gas, we in the future can use it in the same way the technology, but use sustainable sources of carbon like biomass or even CO2 from biogenic sources. But most importantly, we can use green hydrogen then from water electrolysis and renewable energy. And mm. those two components, the CO and the hydrogen, that is what we use to make our fuels and chemicals and all the other products. So, so whilst it is a reinvention of ourselves with hydrogen, today we use around two and a half million tons of gray hydrogen. So the, the demand is there for us to replace that with green hydrogen if we get a commensurate um, you know, supply of uh, biogenic sources of CO2. So there is a match there, but part and parcel of the thinking is also that we are currently uh, supplying about 30% of the country's fuel and energy need in that sense. And we've got a retail footprint. We've got the ability to enhance that and transition also from fuel to electrical uh, loading stations to eventually hydrogen dispensing at these retail stations. But that, of course, I foresee is only around 8 to, to 12 years away. We are not looking at that in the immediate future. An ENCA exclusive has revealed a cover-up in a deadly car accident involving interim chairperson of the Provincial Economic Development Agency, Chibiane Clifton Kadimeng. According to evidence, the vehicle was not roadworthy and had an invalid license disc when the crash happened in July, which claimed the lives of five people. Now, ENCA anchor Masejo Rojaja spoke to Simon Zwane, spokesperson for the Road Traffic Management Corporation on all angles. With the evidence that we have, it's that, uh, uh, you know, the driver or the owner of the Mercedes-Benz GL500, that is Mr. Ngadiming, later did some cover-ups. And I know you can't go into the details of the case, but VTS is also something that falls under the RTMC's uh, mandate. So under what circumstances, for instance, Mr. Zwane, would VTSs uh, either be closed, suspended for corrupt dealings or for uh, being involved in cover-ups like this? Yeah, strictly speaking, VTSs do not fall under the uh, RTMC. They are authorized, that's the mandate of the provincial departments of transport. And where evidence of corruption has been found, it mm -hmm. becomes the responsibility of the, of the relevant department to then close, uh, close that uh, testing station for violation of the of its mm. uh, license conditions, uh, National Road Traffic Act regulations, and all of that. Mm. So the, the investiga an investigation would have to, to be done. A report presented that shows the kind of irregularities have been found at, at the particular testing station, mm. and a recommendation mm. made to the MEC to close it. Could the Kramer family in the Eastern Cape finally receive their land. They say their land claim was found to be compliant as per a report done by an independent researcher. In what has been described as one of the biggest land claims in the country, the family is hoping the matter will finally be put to rest. ENCA anchor Baron Hafke spoke to Kramer family spokesperson Liesl Flanagan on Newslink.
so, so, so basically all the evidence that you've now submitted, it seems like you are still doing so much work, even though it seems like you've already done enough, but it seems like you're already doing extra work just to make sure that, you know, that all your claim, everything is in order from your side at least. But you're saying the government's now playing a delaying tactic, if that's what I assume now what you've said. Um, what are you expecting from this report now? Look, the report was compiled by myself. It's not an expectation. From or the, fee the feedback from the government side, rather. Yeah. The feedback that we have to have, the, what they did was our claim was uh, gazetted, as we were told by the Department of LCC. Our claim was gazetted, but it was not yet published because of the dispute in extent, the size mm. of the claim. And the report will be handed to them. They will do a memo and it will be presented to national office for approval and signature. Thereafter, they do the internal procedures and they do the stakeholders meeting. Well, um, from our side, I think the viewers and you can agree, 27 years of a claim of this magnitude, it's a disgrace that we are still fighting. We have gone above and beyond. The Restitution Act only requires two factors to be proven. Number one, that the land was owned by, by Darman Kramer, and number two, that there was illegal eviction mm. and um, disposition after June 1913. We have done that, but we do know that as of the 27 years, delay tactics yeah. upon delay tactics. Stay tuned to the day that was more top stories right after the break.